Welcome to the Insight Myanmar podcast. Before we get into today's show, I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more written and video content on our website. If you haven't visited it yet, we invite you to take a look at www.insightmyanmar.org. In addition to complete information about all of our past episodes, there's also a variety of blogs, books, and videos to check out. And you can also sign up for our regular newsletter. But for now, enjoy what follows. And remember, sharing is caring. Okay, and welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing a topic that we've wanted to cover for some time, uh, and that is the ongoing protests in Iran and uh, the historical and the social context that has led to the situation that we see now. And it may be a little bit off topic from the usual uh, Myanmar content that we produce, but I think you're going to find that there are a lot of similarities between the social movements and the uprisings and the very long history of government repression in both countries. And my guest today to discuss this with us uh, is, is Paradis Mahnavi. Um, Paradis, if you could uh, introduce yourself for our audience, I think they would appreciate that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me uh, on the show. My name is Paradis Mahdavi. I am the provost and executive vice president of the University of Montana, where I'm also a professor of anthropology. Excellent. And you, you've spoken uh, quite a lot on, on uh, different platforms about the Iranian social context and, and the Iranian history. Most of our uh, audience is probably not going to be particularly familiar with it. So Although we can see the revolution, how the protest movement happening now, um, how how did Iran get to the situation where women are being dragged off the street for for not wearing a hijab, or or the point at which you know youth are willing to go out into the streets and and throw firebombs at statues of uh, national heroes? What what led up to this? You know, um, it's difficult to know exactly where to start in Iran's, you know, thousand year history. <laughs> um, I think it's perhaps most useful to start um, at the Mashrute or Constitutional Revolution in 1910. Um, that was one of the, you know, earliest social movements where you had people pouring into the streets, um, calling for a more democratized Iran. Uh, so, so this notion of the people being absolute participants in their future and absolute participants in creating a more peaceful, democratic and representative Iran, this dates back, you know, more than 100 years. So I think that's, that's, that's a really important place to start. Um, you know, I Iran has a, a long history uh, of social movements, of street politics. Uh, and, and so, you know, in, in the 1910, you had people, 1910s, you had people agitating for a constitution that was representative of the people. Um, you know, this was followed by, again, another uh, period uh, of monarchical rule. Um, and then in, you know, 1953, you had a democratically elected leader, Prime Minister Mossadegh, who came to power. Uh, and of course, forgive me as I'm compressing some of this history, but you know, want to give a brief overview for your listeners, and, and you should feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, you know, Mossadegh came to power uh, also under a fabric of returning Iran to Iranians because there was this feeling that the Shah, the, the monarchy that was in power in Iran, um, had become overly infatuated with the West or West-toxicated. 
and that the Shah had become a puppet of, of the West. And Mossadegh uh, really wanted to uh, enact changes like um, nationalizing the oil prices and, um, you know, uh, uh, working with, with, with farmers and, you know, in the agricultural sector, et cetera. So, um, his his election, however, was short lived. Uh, in 1953, there was a. It's now been documented that there was a CIA backed coup that removed mm. Mossadegh and reinstalled the Shah of Iran um, into into power. Um, you know, during the Shah, you also had people feeling, especially after 1953, feeling very much like the government wasn't necessarily. Um, aligned with with the people. And so, you know, in the in the 1970s you began to have alternative resistance movements uh springing up to challenge the monarchy. Uh and and you know, you had movements like Marxism, fem, you know, certain feminist movements and then you had a, a movement called Islamic Marxism with people like Abdul Karim Surush at the head um and you know, really writing about a different form of democracy and and again bringing Iran for Iranians. One of the loudest voices in the 1970s was a, a, a cleric by the name of Ayatollah Khomeini, whom every you know most people are familiar with by now, but who was exiled in France and would send his speeches recorded on cassette tapes uh, into Iran, and promised to bring back Iran for Iranians, uh, and you know very critical of the opulence and West toxication of the Shah, um, and you know his words gained a lot of traction. Uh, and in 1978, 1979, Iran had uh, the revolution, which installed the Islamists uh, into power. So let me let me jump in there. Like, there's a theme that you've been touching on um, this this Western influence. Like, is it because I, I know this claim is often made? I'm wondering what your uh, stance on this is. Would it be fair to say that the the installation uh, of of the Shah, even before 1953, was backed by colonial forces. Like I vaguely remember uh, from Persepolis that uh, that the the British military was sort of involved in helping pick the person who would become the Shah because they wanted to have someone you know controlling Iranian oil. Uh, right. That that there was always this colonial. Um, Let's slice up Iran for ourselves in the background. So, this theme that we see today, with with the the regime saying, "Oh, everything is outside influence. Everything is American influence. It's Israeli influence. It's European influence." There's quite a long history of legitimate um, exploitative influence of Western powers in Iran. Like that, that would be a historically defensible statement, would it not? Yes, I, I I definitely think that that is that is accurate. But I think it's an interesting tension you point to, right? Because on the one hand, you definitely had this heavy hand of the colonial powers uh, at play. But on the other hand, if you think about it, Iran was one of the few countries in the region to never have been formally colonized, right? Mm. And Iranians are quite proud of that. Um, and so, you know, while yes, there was absolutely the heavy hand of the British, and you know, there's a, a very popular, you know, long-standing popular Iranian uh, comedy called um, Daijan Napoleon, which is my uncle Napoleon, uh, and the very the most famous line of that um, of film is "Kar Kar Inglisas," which is, you know, the 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 whatever sort of mischief or 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 you know, terrible things have happened. It's it's because of the British, um, and mm. that became. Kind of something that people were were repeating over and over again. So certainly, there's been this heavy hand of colonial powers over the years. What you know, but but Iranians are still quite proud of the fact that they have resisted that, and and that's been a really powerful, um, animating call, I think, uh, for the people of Iran is this this idea of Iran for Iranians. You know, no outside meddling, right? Mm. And. So now I was, I was actually just looking the other day at uh, some of the history of Iran post-revolution with regard to uh, connections with Shia uprisings in in um, Syria versus Israel and the the weaponization of this narrative of outside influence by by the regime. So it, it definitely seems to be very perversive. Um, very much, yes. Element. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. So okay, so let's let's talk the revolution. So we have the the Islamic Revolution comes in, Ayatollah Khomeini comes in and and he's greeted by 
throngs of cheering crowds at at the airport uh and and he sort of steps up and becomes the leader of of the revolution is there any particular reason why it was this islamic uh opposition that became the preeminent uh movement against the the, the shah <laughs> I think that that people really resonated with, you know, Khomeini's words and, and this Islamic movement, this idea of um, taking Iran back to a, a time, you know, now, of course, taking Iran back, it, it can be problematic, mm. right, when you go backwards in time. But this notion of of bringing back this 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 Iranianness before it had been tainted, you know, with mm. Uh, with you know outside influence, for instance, people talk a lot about you know in the early seventies. Uh, you know, there's even this very famous quote from uh, the French designer Yves Saint Laurent, who said that you know after the runways of Paris, it was the streets of Tehran where women were you know wearing mini skirts and Yves Saint Laurent designs, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that you know the Islamist uh, rhetoric certainly appealed to a segment of the population who felt quite you know, tired of this. I also think it's, it's very true that, you know, there was class stratification, you know, very extreme class stratification. Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 the Shah had, you know, his secret police, the Sabak, um, mm. who, who also had been, you know, um, you know, committing human rights, uh, uh, violations. And so, you know, I think that, um, Th this notion of you know trusting in in spirituality right in 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 kind of going back to you know the roots with islam i think that i think people found that appealing i mean this is i mean this is something that we see in in almost every country i uh, my my sort of theory is that there are three ways to present this narrative you either say we're going to return the country to a glorious state that existed before or we're going to return the country to the glorious state that would have existed if the other people hadn't come in and and uh, and ruined it. Right. Um, or we're going to just, you know, stop the other people from taking us away from the glorious present that we've established. But it always is this hearkening back to whatever was before was good, whatever is now is bad, and exactly. I promise to drag us back to that thing that didn't really exist, but I've convinced you that that's what used to exist. Um, yep. And, and we've seen that, the, you know, Make America Great Again is just a, a rehashing of that same mentality. That's exactly um, right. That's exactly right. It's, it's quite it's quite sad. And so and this is the thing. To, to those who haven't seen these, I strongly recommend jumping on Google, checking these out. We have photographs of Iran pre-revolution. We have photographs of Afghanistan pre-Taliban. Uh, and we see women in the 1960s with short hair, heads uncovered, um, the same types of fashion, the same types of clothes that would be common in the 1960s in in the UK or the United States or continental Europe. Are you saying that there was dissatisfaction with this degree of modernization and freedom? Was it being perceived as as overt Western imperialism? You know, I, I think I think people took issue with um with it, the inequality that was rampant, right? Because mm -hmm. while well, yes, you you did see you know like women wearing those designs that we've just been talking about, right? But you also had people who were starving, right? And you had the farmers yeah. and you had the merchant class, right? Um, and and then I think there was also this idea that you know modernity. I don't think people were necessarily opposed to modernity, you know, modernity qua modernity. But I mm -hmm. think there was this this notion, this idea that you know, why does modernity have to equal Westernization? You know, is there another form of modernity that's much more, shall we say, homegrown? Um, you know, and th this is what you know people like Gatris Spivak write about. You know, can the subaltern speak? Like, is there a subaltern, you know, version of modernity? And I think I think many people, for many people, Islamic Marxism held that promise of being a modernity rooted in equality uh, and, and, mm. and, and just being an alternative pathway forward. And I think that, that sets us up uh, for a very sad and ironic look at um, the things that have actually happened and not happened in Iran since then. So let's, let's jump forward a little bit in time. Um, media coverage, people have seen things thrown around like the Revolutionary Guard, the Basij, um, the Gashti Ershad, the, the morality police. Right. 
Yeah. But, but I think most people don't really have a concept of really who these people are and what it is that they can do. Like, can you give us an overview of what, what, what these groups are and why they exist? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, I think right now, probably it's most useful to start with the Gashta Irshad, mm-hmm. which is the morality absolutely. police. Uh, because if, you know, if, if folks have been seeing the headlines since September, uh, Mahsa Amini, uh, Gina Mahsa Amini, mm-hmm. a young Kurdish uh, Iranian woman was uh, taking a trip to Tehran in September. And when she stepped off the train at the, at the train station, you know, her headscarf was slipping back a bit, but not more than many other young women. And she was taken in by the morality police and suffered uh, cruelty and brutality at their hands and died in custody, uh, you know, roughly 24 hours later. This ignited um, the, the movement that we're seeing on the ground in Iran today. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, I think before uh, uh, Gina Maso Amini's death, I think very few people even knew about, let alone talked about, the morality police or the Gashta Irshad. Um, people often focused on the Revolutionary Guard, or you know, they focused on the Council of Guardians, who are the Islamic version of um, almost a Senate, right? We would say in the United States, the morality police are the um, the police, an, an arm of law enforcement, excuse me, vested with the following charge: upholding right and forbidding wrong. That is the charge that they are vested with. Now, you can imagine, though, that that has quite a lot of room for leeway, right? So, you Mm. know, they are vested with, um, you know, ensuring that people are wearing proper Islamic dress, uh, which includes the veil, hijab, right? But it also Mm. includes other things. And and, and I think it's important to note that it's not just hijab and it's not just women. Um, The morality police would take men, young men in for having, you know, eye-catching accessories and faux hawks. Um, or, you know, ripped jeans, you know, um, tank tops even, right? Um, so it's it's really about, uh, you know, this was the arm of law enforcement that was policing austerity, was policing morality. Um, so for women, it might, it might be a job, it might be lipstick, it might be nail polish. Um, it, you know, it might be holding hands with a member of the opposite sex when mm. you're not married. Uh, the morality police were known for raiding parties, um, so if there were parties where people were drinking, and, and as a side note, uh, alcohol drinking is technically illegal in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm. And, you know, morality police would break, you know, bust up parties and and take folks in who were seen drinking and dancing, et cetera. So they are really, they were the arm of law enforcement um, that were charged with the operationalization of Islamic values, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think for, for those who've read uh, Persepolis, um, there is that famous scene where where that they're drinking and they're dancing, um, and that's that's another thing that I did not realize how much dancing matters to people until I saw the the Iranian when I was going to university. I was hanging out with the Iranian students, and the value they placed on being able to go to a party and dance, males and females all together in the same room, was surprising to me because I looked at that like. I mean, you can just go to a club. Like, I don't, I don't get the point. But to them, it's like, well, no, no one's going to raid us here. No one's going to kick down the door here. And and in Persepolis, there's that scene where they get chased out of the party, and somebody dies falling off a roof, being chased by by the morality police. So I think, I think it's valuable to recognize just how much weight these people have, how much power they have. Because mm-hmm. in other countries we have, you know, various groups who are there, there to design to protect standards, but they don't usually kill people. They, right, and, and, and also they're they're also it's it's very <laughs> opaque, you know, how and why they make the decisions they make, mm-hmm. um, and and it and it changes, right? So you know, there might be a period of a few months where you know people can walk around, you know, they could go to parties and dance and drink, and no one's going to raid them. But then maybe you're coming up, you know, up against an election, or you're coming up against a religious holiday, and then suddenly. Suddenly now, now the same thing that you wouldn't have been arrested mm. for two weeks ago, now you're arrested for it. You know, it's, just, it's, it's so, it's so unpredictable, I should say. Yeah. Because we, because we've seen, you know, Gina, I mean, like the way she had her hijab in certain previous times would yeah. have been common and nobody would have done anything about it. Absolutely. So it's quite arbitrary and not to sort of try to hone in on, on what I'm sure must be a very painful experience, but I believe you yourself were, were detained 
by the Gash Dershod for delivering a, a seminar. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, um, yes. And I should, you know, back up to, to say that I'm, I'm somebody who's been researching um, young people and gender and sexual politics in Iran for more than two decades now. Um, and I began doing fieldwork in Iran in um, 1999, 2000, focusing on what young people called the Engelob Agency uh, or a sexual revolution. And um, I, I followed them for a period of, of six years as they used their bodies to speak back to a regime that they felt was, you know, overly obsessed with with comportment and with bodies. Um, you know, they they said, okay, this is a regime that flexes its muscles, you know, uh, and operates its power through a fabric of morality. So we're going to question the regime by questioning that fabric of morality. Uh, and and so they engaged in in what they were calling a sexual revolution. I was documenting this, um, you know, in the in the early two thousands. And and when I began my field work, it was under the rule of um, ref, a reformist president, President Khatami. Uh, and so you know, I was able to do a fair amount of research, you know, following and 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 learning about sexual behaviors, even though premarital sex is technically illegal. I was learning about how people you know, use and engage in things like partying and sexual behaviors as a way to speak back against a regime with which they did not agree. Um, you know, young people saying we're, we're exactly what you experienced yourself at, at school, the people saying we're so suffocated, we can't even go to a party and dance that then, you know, that they were sort of finding extreme ways to express their frustration. So I, I was, I was, I was focusing on this youth movement. And I wrote a book called Passionate Uprisings, Iran Sexual Revolution, which came out in 2007. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I was uh, delivering a lecture uh, uh, that was introducing the concepts of my book. My Many of my interviewees were quite adamant that I, you know, present the results of my fieldwork in Iran first, um, which, which, which made sense to me because I had been spending all this time uh, doing research in Iran uh, with, and they had opened their hearts and their stories to me. So, you know, I, I, I went to give a lecture at the University of Tehran uh, 13 minutes into my lecture describing Iran's sexual revolution, the auditorium doors burst open. Uh, and I, I can't remember if I saw them, heard them, or smelled them first, but um, you know, the auditorium erupted into pandemonium. Um, you had morality police coming in, people were running every which way. And I should have been shredding my lecture notes, but I was sort of in a state of suspended animation, I was standing there frozen, gripping the podium with both hands. And I, it was almost as if it were happening in slow motion. I watched as, you know, a, a few morality policemen climbed the four stairs that I had climbed just moments earlier, came onto the stage where I was standing. And the last thing I remember was looking up um, as a hand was coming down towards me. And then I, and then I blacked out. So, I mean, <laughs> There was was what you were doing actually illegal? Like, were there any laws actually being broken? Well, you know, I had several charges leveled against me, right? So one of those being, you know, trying to foment a velvet revolution. Oh, of course. Right. So the, the, <laughs> that that so that, that a vague charge. Way. Say that again. It's a vague charge. Yes, a vague charge, and of course, it's not like one gets to go to court, right? Mm. <laughs> And test it. Um, it's a vague charge. One doesn't know where it has come from, who has leveled it, what the evidence is. You know, there, it's not that it's not as though there's due process, right? So this is not actually the police have arrested you on a criminal charge and have filed papers with the court. There's no, no. appeal oversight process. No, no, and it's not exactly like it's registered in the system that you've got this case against you. Nothing. So. You're so you don't you're exist for a period of time. Mercy. Yeah, and you're completely at their mercy, right? I mean, that's insane. Like, we, we would view this as a lesser branch of law enforcement, and yet they seem to have significantly more power than actual criminal enforcement police. I mean, I, in some ways, yes, right? I think in some ways, yes. Um, and yet, like it changes, right? It changes depending on who's president. It depend. It changes depending on, you know, like I said, what the season is. You know, sometimes they have an enormous amount of power, and sometimes 
you know, you have a president who wants to perhaps disempower them, right? It, it's it's constantly in flux. And the challenge with it being so vague is that one never knows where one stands and one never knows the degree to which they have power. Um, it, it's difficult because their charge being upholding right and forbidding wrong could be interpreted in a myriad number of ways. Yes. And so that that I think is is what makes it even more challenging, right? So here in the United States, we have a sense for what the police are vested with, what what you know what authority they have. We have a, a, an idea of what a criminal court you know has authority to do, what a divorce court has authority to do, right? We have a sense of of process, of authority, of you know how things might transpire, right? And I think it's yeah. it's challenging because here you have an instance where that target is constantly shifting. I mean, that's ridiculous. And so is there, is there general support for, for groups like this? I know that, for example, in, in Saudi, there are some people who do support the Muta'in, who are the, the Saudi equivalent of the morality police. Right. And some right. people view them as, you know, I've spoken to Saudi women who say, well, if, if a man harasses me on the street, if I go to the police, there's going to be a police report. I'm going to have to appear. I'm going to have to give evidence. It can tarnish my reputation. If I go to the Mutalain, well, they, they can take care of that problem for me quietly. It doesn't hurt my reputation. It doesn't put me in a painful position of having to give evidence. Mm -hmm. So some people support that. Is there support in Iran for the Gashta Ershad or does just everyone hate them? I think that, that over time it has changed. I think initially there were a lot of people who were grateful for them for, you know, similar to Saudi Arabia. There were also people who, you know, who I interviewed who were glad that the, that there was such an arm of law enforcement because they said, well, it's good. You know, they're keeping, they're keeping the kids in line, right. You know, they're making sure where you don't have people necking in the park or whatnot. Oh, okay. Right. And I, but I think over time, I think people started to see just, you know, how challenging this, this group was. And also, like th that sort of that willy nilliness of it, like today you're arrested for wearing red lipstick, tomorrow you're not, you know, that I think that inconsistency really um, made it such that they didn't have as much respect or teeth. Right. Uh, and, and so it became like just another way for, for the regime. They, they became an extension of the regime. And when the regime started putting, you know, the, the more of their attention, energy and emphasis on things like, what people are wearing and who's who's at a party with whom, then in solving things like the unemployment crisis, or you know, um, issues around uh, traffic, or or you know the, the issues facing farmers or or the bazaar, when it became clear that the government was more vested in things like you know sexual behaviors than in unemployment, that mm. I think is when things really changed. And so let's so let's move forward into those the concerns, the manifestation. So Gina Mahsa, she's taken uh, by the police. She's brutalized. Um, we have camera footage of her collapsing and she subsequently uh, dies of her injuries. This triggered something that we, we haven't seen before. So we, we've spoken previously about um, things like the Green Movement, um, and, and, you know, street protests in 2018 and, and my stealthy freedom on, on, as an online movement, um, this that we're seeing now is on another level. Yes. What, um, what, what, what did like clearly, clearly this cannot just be mass harmony. She's not the only victim of the Gesht Ershad. Um, she's not what like how did this come about what's actually happening right now so i think what what we have seen happen has been a gra it's gone from a gradual simmer to a boiling point right mm -hmm. i think that um you know after the revolution, you know, we stopped kind of our our our, our history, you know, conversation in, at, at the revolution. I think initially everyone is excited, right? Khomeini comes on, and then I think when you know the, when Khomeini takes power and he creates the Gashta Ershad and he creates the Revolutionary Guard and he creates the Council of Guardians and and a role for himself as a supreme leader, um, and and they start to operationalize their power through this fabric of morality. I think that that is when people start to say, hang on a second, um, you know, this isn't exactly 
better than the time of the Shah, that they're not trying to solve our hunger issues or our unemployment issues. They're not doing what, you know, they're not bringing back Iran for Iranians. They're taking Iran for, you know, this interpretation of Islam and people started to have this, this disenchantment, which, which absolutely grew. And so the 1980s were marked by the Iran Iraq war, you know, a decade long war. Um, and, and, you know, people started to have this sort of questioning of the regime, like, okay, but you know, now, now we're in this war and, you know, how many casualties. And during this time, the regime enacted pronatalist policies. They enacted policies that encouraged families to have as many children as possible. So for example, any family that had more than two children got a tax break and any family that had five children or more got a free plot of land. Um, this resulted in a population boom, population explosion almost um, in the eighties and the early nineties, right? You had just, you know, a very high fertility rate. Somewhere in the 90s, um, there was this realization that, wow, our population levels are, you know, very, <laughs> we're, we're, we're kind of getting skewed here. And, and I don't know if we don't know if the, if the government can sustain this. And so they did a complete 180 and they enacted uh, mandatory family planning policies. Um, where every couple had to take a family planning class to get married. Um, families that had more than three children were taxed. Um, and you had all these messages going out that said, you know, fewer children, better life, et cetera. And so what happened was that Iran's fertility rate dropped from, you know, nearly four per per woman to, to you know, 1.3 per, per woman, uh, which... <laughs> interestingly enough, earned Iran the award, the family planning award from the United Nations wow. uh, in, in the 1990s. Now, but that's significant because what you have is this huge population boom of young people, <clears throat> young people born between, you know, 1979 1978, 79, and 1995, let's say. So when I started doing my field work um, in 99, 1999, uh, 70% of Iran's population was under the age of 25. I mean, that is a massive, right? And, and most mm -hmm. of them were kind of within, you know, 10 years of each other. It's sort of, you know, it, it, it resembles a bulge, like, like, you know, a snake swallowing a rabbit. Imagine that, right? You've, you yeah. have like huge bulge of people, you know, of a certain age who were not around during the time of the Shah. So they don't necessarily believe the rhetoric of the regime about, oh, the Shah was so awful and it was, things were, the, you know, it's like, well, at least people could wear what they wanted and people could, you know, do dance and listen to music and et cetera and have fun. And, you know, there's this very famous Khomeini quote um, that, you know, I would often see young people spray painting over. And the Khomeini quote was, you know, the Islamic revolution is not about fun. There's no fun to be had in the Islamic Republic. And you always see people spray painting around that. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so these are people, these are young people who, like I said, they don't, they don't remember the Shah. They weren't, they, they were not, all they know is the world that they were, the Iran they were born into was an Iran marked by war, revolution, you know, this sort of austerity. Um, and, and as, you know, as young people grew up and got more and more educated, um, you had eventually, you know, by 2000, 60% of university graduates were women, um, but women faced a 45% unemployment rate. So you had a highly educated young population with a high unemployment rate, and they are very disenchanted. So what do you think they're going to do, right? They're going to find ways to express themselves. And you, so this was the generation who very much was leading that movement that I, that I was talking about, that sexual revolution, which, you know, it, it kind of birthed the green movement of 2009, um, where people were saying, you know, this is not my vote. They were, they were um, criticizing what they saw as the fraudulent reelection of a hardline president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, and, and so what you saw with the green movement is, you know, more than just young people coming out, you know, so it was more than just in the sexual revolution. It was larger than that. Um, you had, you know, led by women, very iconic image of Neda, a sultana young woman who was, you know, gunned down by revolutionary guards in the protest was a very iconic image of that time. Um, and that, but then after 2009, these subsequent movements that you, that you mentioned, you had my stealthy freedom, one, the 1 million signatures campaign, et cetera. Each subsequent movement was larger than the previous one. With each subsequent passing year, this um, disen disenchantment with the regime grew. And it grew because 
people started to see that this was not a regime that was invested in making Iran better for Iranians, that people were suffering, you know, the, 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 the real, the realities of sanctions, that people were, um, suffering from unemployment, that traffic was getting worse, that travel was getting impossible, that Iran was being shut out from the rest of the world. And, and as, you know, as we, as the world became more and more connected and, you know, social media and, and you know, that sort of that internet, that, that fourth, you know, the fourth way, the fourth world, right. That, that sort of the internet superhighway, people started to see what they were missing and, and where their government was falling short. Uh, and as gas prices went through the roof and the government still did nothing, suddenly you had people of all different classes and all different backgrounds saying, wait a second, this is not a regime that's looking out for us. And, and so, like I said, each subsequent movement, you had more people, right? So, you know, more, my stealthy freedom reached more people than, than the green movement. Um, and then you had a series of protests, uh, that, you know, outpouring in 2017, 2018, 2019, where people were protesting gas prices. They were protesting, um, uh, the government. Uh, and, and so what was really the catalyzing moment of, of 2022? I think it was, you know, Massa, I mean, he's, um, death and it because it was captured on film. I mean, you know, we think a lot about um, you know the movement for Black Lives and you know uh, 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 George Floyd and 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 Emmett Till and you know and and sort of the power of an innocent dying. Um, I think that was a catalyzing call to everyone that my goodness, if this is a regime that can enact such cruelty to an innocent young woman. Um, how could this regime be representative of the people? And and I think you're touching on so many different topics. And there is the um, the song that became very famous, and and hopefully we'll we'll play uh, part of it uh, in this interview as well. Um, uh, Beroye by by Sheikh yeah. Hajipur, and. What's very telling about this song, it's a very beautiful song, but if anyone hasn't listened to it yet, I strongly recommend that you do. Um, but what's really telling about the song is that very quickly, it moves away from talking about women's liberation. And it starts talking about Havoya um, Olude, right? So it talks about, you know, the, the, the polluted air. It yeah. talks about um, this, this famous scene with the, the dumpster diving boy who's asked what his dreams are and he doesn't understand the meaning of the word dream. Um, you know, it talks about the trees dying. It talks about, you know, the dogs, it talks about the economy failing. It talks about so many different issues. It's evident that these angers that are being manifested on the street, like we might be focusing on the images of women burning their hijab uh, and dancing in the street and cutting their hair short. But right. a lot of the people throwing firebombs are, equally concerned about the fact that they see no future for themselves, that they can't afford to live, they can't pay their rent, they can't pay for petrol. And, and, this, and this is longstanding, like Iranian subversive, let's say Iranian music has for a very long time spoken about these harsh, harsh realities and, and the, the division between rich and poor. And this sort of harkens back to what you were saying before with, with the, the Islamic revolution and Khomeini and, and people's dissatisfaction under the Shah with the stratification of society. But today in Iran, you seem to still have people who live by scrounging through rubbish for scraps of food to eat. And it, mm -hmm. at least the way it's presented through uh, subversive media, uh, this does not, not appear to be a small and isolated problem. This appears to be a just genuine fact of reality for huge, huge, huge numbers of people within the country. Has there actually been improvement or are people now just saying you know what they lied to us I, I think it's the latter i think it's exactly that i think people are saying you know what they lied to us this regime was supposed to fix that right it was supposed to fix you know those the hungry people who are as you just said you know dumpster diving the the hungry dogs right the hungry everybody everybody is hungry mm -hmm. and 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 this regime came to power under this platform of equality right and mm. yet, and yet, these stratifications exist, the pain and the suffering exists, and it is so very visible and so very palpable in people's lives today. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's horrifying. So, so this being the case, I mean, what are we looking at right now? So we've seen horrific crackdowns. And, and again, this was the same thing that we saw in, in Myanmar. Like the protest movement starts right after the coup. And people think, yeah, like we can, we can express ourselves. And then a week and a half into it, um, Miata De Kain, she gets shot in the head by a soldier uh, disguised in police uniform. And she dies of injuries a few days later. And then by the end of that month, we have teenagers. Um, you know, Wei Yantun, he was shot in the head by a sniper rifle. He was 16 or 17 years old. Uh, and they had to take his body away on his, on his own vegetable cart because they didn't have any other way to get him out of there. Um, wow. this, this was within the first month of the coup by the beginning of March, there were coordinated crackdowns by the middle of March, uh, martial law was imposed in, um, six districts of Yangon, uh, with, with shoot on site orders. Um, you know, we, we saw the protests in Hyundai where the factories were being burned by factory workers who, whose main concern was not democracy. Their main concern was we fought tooth and nail to have some semblance of a labor union and some semblance of worker protections over the last couple of years. And we're afraid that all of those are going to be taken away and we're effectively going to be turned into slave labor. And so mm -hmm. the military came in and, and shot about 70 or 80 of them um, in okay. one one afternoon. So oh my goodness. yeah, like absolutely, you know, the, the curtain fell after a, a week and a half of thinking, well, wow. the protests will blow over, it's fine. And then the protest didn't blow over. Well, just kill the people if they're protesting, and then eventually there'll either be nobody left to protest or they'll go home and get back to work. And Iran seems to be following the exact same playbook. It's like, oh, people people are protesting. Well, that's, that's annoying. And then they're still protesting, so let's do mass incarcerations. Let's kill people on the street. Let's use live ammunition. Let's order spates of, of executions. Uh, Iran being the, the second most prolific a uh, user of death penalty uh, in the world today after China. Um, is this actually slowing people down? Like, is there legitimate concern now? And they're going, well, maybe I don't want to protest because maybe I don't want to be arbitrarily murdered on the street or dragged off by, by someone and then executed for, you know, on false charges. Is it is it actually terrorizing the people or are they pressing no. on? No, in fact, I think that's what's that's what's so I think inspiring to so many people is that even with these all of these odds, you know, against them, right? I remember there was this, you know, in in October, the government was um, sorry, the Rev Guard was, you know, using tear gas on protesters, and everyone thought, okay, well, that's that's definitely going to make them think twice about going outside, right? We saw all these mm -hmm. images circulating, and it just increased their resolve, right? It just increased the number of people going out there. And so, you know, what's interesting now, what you hear, what I hear all the time is people say, you know, I, I'll say, but you, you know, you, you see the executions, aren't you afraid, et cetera. And they say, you know, I'd rather die than live like this. And, you, and that's you said it was the, the revolutionary guard. So the, the revolutionary guards raison d'etre is to defend the Islamic state specifically the, yeah. the entire system um, they're there to protect is it is it symbolic of the government panicking that they've invoked the revolutionary guard in this or is it normal for them to just get called in to put down protests I think that in past that they, they've been able to bring in um, you know the morality police and the morality police have been able to bring in you know, allies, um, particularly from the kind of more religious parts of the country to help maintain the order, uh, but not this time. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think it's exactly what you just said, the fact that they've had to, you know, bring in so many different types of law enforcement to contain and to, you know, terrorize essentially, um, that speaks volumes. And so now we've, now we've moved into the, um, the classic sort of, you know, Nazi, Stalinist, communist era of, um, you know, getting a bang on the door in the middle of the night and, and people sort of just being abducted under cover of darkness. Um, is that is that something that's just been perpetually the case or is that a more new uh, tactic? 
Uh, I think that that is a tactic that has come and gone, before, you know, in the past, right? Okay. So I think that, you know, you saw some of that around the green movement. You certainly saw some of that around the green movement, right? Um, people did speak about that happening, you know, even around the revolution time, which predates me, of course, but people did speak mm -hmm. about that happening then. Um, you definitely saw it in the green movement. You definitely saw it around my stealthy freedom. So when, when things start to heat up, that tactic becomes more employed, but it's certainly more employed now than ever before. At least in recent, in recent times. And so about this, so this is another thing. Like when we talk about my stealthy freedom, when we talk about these these abductions in the middle of the night, the, the whole purpose of the abductions is to keep it off the books, is to keep it quiet, is to stop us from getting these these loud scenes. And journalists in Iran are facing a lot of threat and a lot of pressure. And so we've seen organizations outside of Iran collecting information from Iranian citizen journalists. Um, and then telling them like, okay, now that you've sent it to us, like delete it, delete it, delete it, scrub your phone so that they can't find anything on it. Um, and so in response, yet again, uh, exactly the same as in Myanmar, the government have cut off internet access sporadically. Mm -hmm. Is that succeeding in, um, in quelling the, the information flow? Is it stopping people from knowing what's happening? I think it's not actually. Um, I think it is absolutely not. I think people are finding ways around it, right? I mean, people are sending things through through phones. I mean, of course, they're scrubbing, but people are. I mean, look, remember, as I mentioned, that generation, right? That that people. These are people who've grown up under this sort of repression, and so they are masters at finding loopholes. Um, mm. I should also add that, that it's that that the, this particular movement we're seeing right now. Um, it, it is absolutely intergenerational and it's led not by, you know, my generation. So my generation, they call us children of the revolution, right? You know, I mm -hmm. was born in late 1978, you know, my generation, people born in 78, 79, even through the eighties, we're, we're all called the children of the revolution. Right. And so I think my generation was really um, key in that sort of the sexual revolution, the green movement, all of that. Now you actually have the, this moment is being led by what I call the children of the resistance. Those are, are people like my daughter's age, right? My daughter is 12, you know, but, but a lot of our kids are, you know, teenagers and, and, and you, it's being led by these brave schoolgirls who are mm -hmm. out there putting their lives on the line. They grew up in, in revolution. They grew up in resistance because they're the children of the, they are, the children of the children of the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have grown up in this very heightened um, time where they know how to, you know, jump the highest firewalls, if you will. And that I, I just find those, the parallels again are so strong. Like the, the generation that were born in the late sixties and the early seventies in Myanmar uh, would be referred to as the 88 generation because they participated in the student protests of 1988. And yeah. The generation that's currently leading the protests is is referred to as Gen Z, um, for, for obvious reasons. And there is the, there is actually a, this very interesting intergenerational uh, thing where like everyone supports the movement, but you had people who lived through the eighty eight revolution who now have become older, who have children that they don't want to see murdered, um, who have been preaching like let's let's calm down a little bit, let's try to find a middle way, you know, let's let's not get murdered over this and then you've got you know the the, the young generation who is saying like no no it's, it's gone too far like i don't care anymore they can shoot me they can shoot me it's gone too far we're not we're not taking this and it's it's fascinating to see that because they're leading it online they're using all these different technologies and about a third of the people who've been murdered by the military have been underage a little bit more than a third actually 39 percent were the statistics i've most recently got um so these these Again, these parallels are, are fascinating, and I and I know this is a very sensitive topic, and I don't uh, mean to put you in an un, un, unpleasant situation. Um, but again, the fact that that Gina is from a Kurdish minority who have been maligned historically, mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing this sort of unification across uh, ethnic lines, which again, in the Myanmar context, is happening because the military have used ethnic division as a way to divide and conquer. You know, convince one ethnic group that the other ethnic group is their real enemy, and then those two ethnic groups are not going to stand side by side and notice that. Hang on, we're both starving because the military took all our money. Uh, keep them at each other's throats and keep them suppressed. Um, and so it seems to be again the, the, the same thing happening in Iran. Like the different 
ethnic groups. I know there's a large Kurdish minority in the Northwest. I know there's a large Azeri minority in the Northwest. Um, I think there's an Arab minority in the Southwest. Although not. Yes, there are. Much. Yep. And then there's, yeah. you know, then there's different um, religious minorities, right, as well. Right, you have Zoroastrians. Mm. You have you have the Baha'is who've been you know persecuted for a very long time. And are they still Baha'i? Um, they're, I mean, you know, they live in, in very, <laughs> yeah, they, very few, but you know, and, and having to be very careful. But you know, you also have Ar- Armenians, right? Um, you've got um, Iranian Jews. You know, there are different groups of minorities. Um, but but I think you're mm. right about these parallels that you are also seeing these group come these groups, excuse me, coming together. Um, in really mm. in in a really powerful way, and and that's I think that that's one of those really big triggering things yeah. where you can't keep the people separated based on social class or religion, as is so divisive in so many cases, and and is divisive in Myanmar as well, uh, and ethnic group. And once you lose that divide and conquerability, your days are really numbered. And so let's focus on what the future is of this Iranian movement. And and I think we all fervently fervently hope for regime change. Um, but ultimately, I do you think that's even on the cards? You know, I, I actually think it is. Wow. I, I do, you know, people are talking about this moment as another revolution. Um, and, you know, people are, like I said, they are demonstrating extraordinary bravery, extraordinary courage. Mm. And they're willing to, like I said, they're willing to die for their cause. Right. I mean, how many people around the world can say that? Right. They're willing to go out there and put their life on the line day after day after day, willing to die rather than live under this regime. That's a pretty powerful statement. And it's it's a groundswell. It's intergenerational. It's not just women. It's not just about the hijab. It's so much bigger than that. It's so much broader than that. And it's so um it, it, it goes down all the way down into people's like very essence of who they are, that they're out there in the streets fighting for their rights, fighting for what they believe is right and fighting for the Iran that they would like to see. And so I, I think that, you know, one of my colleagues, Ali Ansari, has, you know, has said this and to, to quote him, he said, I think it's far more likely that the people outside of Iran will lose patience with the protests far earlier than the people inside of Iran. And so I think that we're likely to see um, these folks continuing to, to to push for change. I think this is a very important and crucial question because I know that the the Myanmar protests, for example, are dependent on international support. The national unity government is not right. The, the revolutionary government is not recognized uh, by most international stakeholders. And Myanmar, I've always described it as a wealthy country with phenomenally poor people because mm-hmm. years and years of military exploitation have ripped, uh, like unimaginable amount of wealth that should be theirs out of their hands and out of their mouths. Um, and so the people starve while the generals live in golden palaces, quite literally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so aid, food, um, medicine, you know, COVID-19, malaria vaccination, these are all deeply needed. Is the Iranian movement dependent on, on international support and international awareness? Is it important to keep up that pressure? Or is the Iranian movement moving forward no matter what the international community thinks? I think the international community is always going to be a vital component of any such movement, right? I mean, especially when people are up against a government that is as strong and as good at keeping themselves in Mm. power as this particular regime is, right? I mean, I think, so I think that, you know, I think it is actually important that the international community continue to... um, elevate the visibility of the cause, continue to, dis, you know, to, to articulate their support for the Iranian people, continue to, you know, pressure their, you know, their countries to, to, to support uh, the people of Iran. I think that's vital. And so on, on this as well, there's, there's a very important question and I have no idea how it can be answered, but historically, when we look at revolutionary movements, uh, and I mean, this This is something that stretches back hundreds and hundreds of years and across continents. The big, big factor seems to be, can you get ordinary rank and file military on side? Because we live in a world where legitimacy is enforced by brute force. You know, you can either accept laws as they exist, or you can challenge them and get beaten. Um, mm-hmm. The end result is the same. 
if you lose control over the mechanism of the application of that force, which in any country is always ultimately the military, you have lost control of the country, just as a fact. Is right. there any chance of, not the Revolutionary Guard, because they're obviously handpicked to be pathologically loyal to the regime, but mm -hmm. of the rank-and-file military turning around and saying, I don't particularly want to open fire on civilians from my village. I, I would rather not do that. And I would rather shoot the guy who's been, you know, pinching my wages for the last 20 years, um, who lives in opulence while I'm barely getting by, than, you know, killing people who could be my, you know, friends and coworkers and cousins and, and family. Is that going to happen? You know, I think that's a possibility, and I'll tell you why. You know, Iran has a mandatory service component, right? Mandatory, you know, draft fuel. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I observed, even just in the time that I was doing field work in Iran, you know, through 2007, is that 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 you know population bulge that I spoke to you about. You started to see those young people getting into positions of power, including, you know, ending up in, you know, the morality police, the gash day no. or, you know, ending up in different types of law enforcement or, or military. And, 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 you know, they, of course, are, are quite sympathetic to the cause, having grown up in it. And so mm -hmm. even just in the t short time that I was doing my fieldwork, I saw a huge change in attitudes of, of law enforcement. So I do think it's a very real possibility. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, that's something that we can watch for. I think if, if it's possible, I think that's something that needs to be investigated. Definitely in the Myanmar context, you know, we, we talk about the numbers of soldiers who get killed in, um, in skirmishes. We talk about armed insurrection. I mean, there are many armed groups in Myanmar that have existed for decades who are focusing on the, the military, but the information that I get from outside sources tells me the most successful campaign of the revolution in Myanmar has not been military engagements against soldiers. It has been propaganda uh, uh, campaigns, which have convinced soldiers to pick up and defect from the military, take their wives, take their children out of the military bases and simply walk into a, a revolutionary base, put their gun down and say, screw it, I'm out. Um, and then they get welcomed into the fold and they get food and they get, you know, shelter and their their families are, you know, given assistance to flee the country and things like that. That seems to be bleeding the military dry faster than actual military conflict is. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a possibility for it, I think that um, that should be uh, examined. And so yeah. that requires centralization, that requires coordination. And that leads on to the bigger question, is there that right now in this movement? Is it a whole bunch of different people doing their own thing side by side against the government? Or is there actually becoming a centralization of movement? Are we possibly going to see a, a, a secondary revolutionary government uh, forming? I mean, that is certainly being discussed. A transitional government is certainly being discussed. It's certainly being discussed, you know. Um, what that government might look like? Would would there be a transitional government? What would the transitional be, government be on the route to? Who would be some of the leaders? That is certainly something that that is being discussed. So I would say that that it's you know it's yes there there isn't one single figurehead you know at at, at you know that you might point to, but I think that um, it certainly is is organized and, and those conversations are definitely happening. And so. <sighs> Can we can we talk in terms of time time scale? Like, is there any concept of how long this might take? The regime does not appear to be on the brink of collapse. They they threw out to the protesters this phony offer yeah. of undermining the Gash Shod or eliminating the Gash Shod, which thank God nobody nobody fell for uh, yeah. because it was clearly a lie. Yes, uh, but are they are they at risk of? You know, I don't know what uh, compliance is like in Iran, but I think one of the big telling things is going to be, well, if there are state-owned enterprises, if, if electricity comes from the state, are people going to start not paying electricity bills to the state? Are they going to not pay taxes to the state? Um, are, are there ways that people are going to say, you know what, I no longer recognize the legitimacy of the government, and I'm not going to continue supporting it and funding it and allowing it to operate the way that it has? Mm -hmm. is, is, are there any like dates coming up at which there'll be these testing points? Or does it not work that way over there? I think I think it's not exactly that way. Okay. Um, but in terms of timeline, you know, I think that the the Iranian New Year is coming up. Nowruz, mm -hmm. 
uh, is coming up. It's always celebrated on the uh, winter equinox, uh, excuse me, the spring equinox. Uh, so March 20th or 21st. Um, that can sometimes be a catalyzing time or period. Um, some people talk a lot about summer because that tends to be when um, the regime likes to crack down. And so there's, there's more um, outpouring of protest. Um, so, so I think that if we're looking at timelines, we might think a little more seasonally rather than mm. infrastructurally, as you just mentioned. It's interesting you raise Nuruz. Is it not the custom in Iran that if you have lost someone in the last year, you're yeah. still in mourning, you're not meant to participate in Nuruz? Uh, you, I think you're not meant to participate in all of the rituals, um, but but certainly, you know, Nuruz is something that, I think speaks to to Persians around the world. Mm. So I'm just wondering whether yeah. this might lead to a protest movement of the nation as a whole, saying, "Well, we're all we're collectively all in mourning." Yeah. So I mean, I've I've definitely heard that discussed. Oh, so that that is already on the cards. I've 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 heard it mentioned. Yes. Okay, that would be that would be very interesting to see. So ultimately, we're in a position now where everything is in everything everything is on the table. And nothing is certain. Like, there's no way to sort of sense what will happen and what could happen. Where is that ultimately what uh, what we're looking at? We just have to wait and see. Or is there anything that we can do? Are there any predictions that we can make? I think that you know predictions with Iran are always are always tricky. You yeah. know, people often want me to have a crystal ball, and I say with you mm. know one of the things I've learned with Iran is to to not do that. But what I can say is we don't have to just sit and wait silently. I think we can continue to do things like we're doing right now is having the conversation, elevating the visibility, making sure that the international community continues to have this attention and then sharing strategies. I mean, what you just talked about in terms of that campaign that had military defect, I hadn't heard that before. I think sharing strategies like that, these are all ways that we can continue to build them, keep the momentum going and, and build towards change. Excellent. So I'm I'm mindful of your time, so I don't want to um to keep you longer than than we need to. Um, by convention, uh, at the end of the interview, we we always invite the guests to leave us with their thoughts uh, and um, just plant plant a seed in the minds of the listeners, something that they can walk away contemplating and 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 meditating on. So I'd I'd like to invite you to um share anything you'd like our listeners to mull over as the day goes on. Well, thank you for that invitation. I, I guess I, I, what I would want to invite our, our listeners to think about is, you know, what kind of a situation must a people be facing to be willing to die for their cause? Uh, and how can we help them? How can those of us who are not facing those same challenges on a, not just a daily, but on an hourly basis, what is it that we can do to support them and to bring about meaningful and lasting social change that is rooted in justice uh, and, and human rights for all. Many of you know that in addition to running the Insight Myanmar podcast platform, we also formed a nonprofit, Better Burma, to respond to the terror that the Burmese military has been inflicting on the country and its people. We encourage listeners to check out our blog to see what work Better Burma has been carrying out, along with the upcoming projects we hope to support. Right now, as I'm sure you all know, and today's interview only reinforced, that the ongoing need is overwhelming. A donation of any amount goes towards those vulnerable communities who need it most, and it will be so greatly appreciated. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Refugee Camps, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects, as well as upcoming needs. 
You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. برای توی کوچه رخصیدن برای ترسیدن به وقت بوسیدن برای خواهرم خواهرت خواهرامون برای تغییر مغزها که پوسیدن برای شرمندگی برای بیپولی برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کودک زبال گرد و آرزوهاش برای این اقتصاد دستوری برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از رو درختای فرسوده برای پیروز و اعتمال انقرازش برای سگهای بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بیوقفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا برای هاینده برای اجباری برای نخبه های زندانی برای کودکان افغانی برای این همه برای غیر تکراری برای این همه شعار های تو خالی برای آوار خونه های پوشالی برای احساس آرامش برای خرشی پس از شبای طولانی برای غرس های حساب و بیخوابی برای مرد میهن آبادی برای دختری که آرزو داشت به سر بود برای زن زندگی آزادی برای آزادی Oh, ba, yaranan da, da, yaranan, 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 yaranan,